The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Miles. Miles came from down under. So, Miles, if you can tell us where and when you were born, and if you can describe what it was like where you grew up, the sort of schools you went to, and the education that you received. How are you, Miles? I'm I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, That's my yeah. That's the accent. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. I'll, I'll work with it. Um, Thanks, mate. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Yeah. So uh, I come from a city called Adelaide, which is on the south central coast of Australia. Not a gateway city. It's not a place where people go by choice for the most part because it doesn't go anywhere and it's not on the way to anything. Um, north of us is desert. South of us is the Antarctic. So we get a kind of a climate which is balanced, I guess, between the two. Mm. One would say it's Mediterranean. It'd be like living in, say, Palermo, Italy. Um, and it's a very big wine district, so a lot of wineries and, and things like that. So that kind of describes the area. Um, I was born there in the early to mid-60s, uh, although I don't remember. Of course, I was a kid. I wouldn't remember anything. But I guess it, it sort of followed through to education. I I had that typical uh, kindergarten slash uh, junior primary kind of education that you would get. Um and, of course, you know, we're a British Commonwealth uh, mm-hmm. territory, so uh, every morning you'd uh, sing your, uh, swear your allegiance to the Queen of England. And um, back in the early days when I was growing up, it used to be God Save the Queen was our national anthem. That mm. changed later, but uh, for the most part, I have a very a very British background, very British heritage. Um, and about the age of five, six, maybe, my mother stuck a violin under my chin and said, kid, you're going to play in a symphony orchestra one day. And I said, what's a symphony orchestra? And what's this stupid <laughs> thing you stuck under my chin? Um, and, and, I, and I proved it, and she was right. By the age of 12, I was in the junior, junior symphony orchestra in, in South Australia and playing in these big concert halls. And it was a, a, an experience at the time I didn't really understand, but I look back on it and go, wow, that was pretty epic. But um, So you educa- got the screeching age with it. They know him. They, they, <laughs> they normally give, give these things to, to, just, to, just to annoy their parents. I mean, I'm sure that's what they do. The kids come over with a, look, I've got a violin. And, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it would have been really popular if she made me learn the drums. Can you imagine what that would have been like? <laughs> so uh, yeah. So anyway, I, I finished up school, went to high school, and they decided they wanted to put me into a uh, a private uh, college. So it was going from one sort of school, which was like public, and you got what the government gave you, into oh, you're going to wear a suit and tie and a blazer, and it's going to go into Hogwarts. So, um, and it was an all boys school. So it was a real traditional uh, school. And I did that for a few years until I just got sick and tired of it. And, mm. and I said to my dad, um, I'd, I'd started getting really interested in electronics and gadgets and stuff like that. And this is in the days of say girls then. <laughs> oh, Hey, how many girls does a kid with a violin get really? Right. <laughs> I ended up dumping that and learnt the guitar and that didn't even work. So, no, I, I, I found myself on CB radios all the time. That was my, you know, vice mm. back in those days. So I learned everything about electronics and radios and physics and all that sort of thing. And, and then um, the first ever personal computer came out and I, like, stumbled into that and said, said, hey, these are pretty cool. They actually respond back to what you're saying, unlike my parents or, you know, any other adult, <laughs> they're like, shut up, kid, you know, go over there in the corner. I'm like, look, I can type something. The computer t- treats me like I'm an equal. I can't believe it. Um, and so I became a software developer at a very young age. And I, I reckon uh, about uh, maybe 15 years old I was, I went to my dad and I said, why are you paying for this expensive private education when, there's this whole new industry of computers opening up and I need to be a part of it. Why don't you let me get out of school and go into the workforce and become a software developer? And I must've been really convincing. I don't know. Uh, because he said, <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> and the rest is history. And I, I became a, a young kid with a small business running, writing software in an industry where supply and demand was tilted very heavily in my favor. Mm. And um, by the age of 22, I wrote software for large defense contractors building $5 billion submarine contracts. And I wrote software for forensic science labs and universities that I never went to or wouldn't have me. I wrote software for the attorney general's department in my state for big corporate, you know, building companies, uh, agriculture, everything. I, I, I did software for everything. And, and then I, I, I and I was 20, 22, 23. I think you've raced ahead quite a lot there. Yeah. <laughs> we, need, we need to come back a little bit. All right. So, so your junior school then, your, 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 your elementary school, mm -hmm. what was that like? Um, was that uh, in your local, local area? Was it close by or did you have to get bus yeah. down? No, no, I, I, I rode my bike to school every day. So it was, I guess, within maybe three miles, something like that. All right. So yeah, not too, not too far. In Australia is spread way yeah. far apart, isn't it? Everything's, I mean, a long way away. It, it, it was. We lived on the outskirts of the city of Adelaide, and when my parents first bought the land there and they built, it was uh, farmland, it, um, horse property, just a lot of horse ranches yeah. and stuff like that. By the time I was, I guess, in my teenage years, it had become part of the city and it was no longer the fringe but I was so lucky because growing up out in the what was effectively the country at the time, we had a national park next to us, which was huge. I mean, massive. And all of my adventures as a kid with my friends and neighbours and so on were in was in the park. So I became very close to nature. That was just where I found my peace. Um, and yeah. And I think that's a, that's something that today, I you know, I mean, I don't want to fast forward 50-odd years, but um, if I look back now, that understanding of nature was so important in everything that I've done ever since because you learn in a, a country where uh, this, this is something that people don't often understand about being raised in Australia. It probably is the case in some African nations too, but Australia has more... Uh, insects that will kill you than any other country, more snakes that will kill you than any other country. You can't go in, swim in the, uh, down at the beach in the ocean without worried about sharks and jellyfish that will kill you. Um, mm. Everywhere you go, you're raised with risk mitigation as part of your, it's, it's your ideology, it's your id. Um, so you, and you can't even go to the dunny without having the risk of a, a black right. jumping up and biting you on the ass. That is so true. It is so true. Um, red belly, what were they called? The little red belly spiders, red, the black red fungus spider. Oh yeah, we have them all, mate. We got everything. Um, yeah. yeah, and and you grow up with that, and so you kind of take it in your stride after a while. And I didn't realize how important that was. Um, later on, as I traveled the world, it was much more important. But um, yeah, we, we're raised with that. So now. DNA, but with it comes a certain respect uh, that you are not always the apex predator, right? You're not, yeah. you're not the one that uh, somebody out there is trying to eat you for lunch, and so you've <laughs> got to be, you've got to be respectful of that, right? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, I, I spend time in big urban cities, New York City, LA, Chicago, uh, and you know, over there, it's a different level of risk. You, you're dealing with a different predator, but yeah. Where I grew up, it was Mother Nature was your predator you had to watch out for. <laughs> so, so, so you managed to survive so survive that. <laughs> so you're moving up then from, from your, your junior school to your, your uh, was it high school over there or was it secondary school? Yeah, secondary school, I think is probably a good yeah. way of putting it. So so you didn't go to the local one. Did, they sent you off to this, this all-boys college. Somewhat, yeah. We, 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 I was, it was still within bicycle range for me, which was good, but we did have a boarding school uh, there for a lot of the agricultural uh, farming kids that came in from uh, from farming countries. And I, I met them and made friends with them, and they were wonderful because they were real, you know, salt-of-the-earth kind of down-to-earth people. They 
yeah. everything to them was uh, different than living on the farm. And and although they copped a lot of, I, I, you know, keep people poke fun at them for being, you know, country bumpkins kind of thing. But the, to me, they were the people who were closer to to God, if you like, uh, because <laughs> you know they have to they have to survive on what they can grow out of the ground and. And yeah. what they can harvest, so you know, all power to them. Yeah, you know, I guess it must be a, a fairly tough upbringing that in the outback uh, on these these farming stations that that are miles from anywhere, uh, and, and and I guess kids are, are, are sort of a lone a lone child or an only mm-hmm. child coming into then then it, it, it must be mind blowing for them at times uh, being with a, a load of other kids that. It, <laughs> It's true. I mean, yeah. the, the, the and services be away from mum and dad as well in boarding. So yeah, because that that was a test for them. Yeah, and the services that we would take for granted, things like uh, doctors, they don't have those. So they have a thing in Australia called the Royal Flying Doctor Service, which is just basically yeah. a a fleet of private, you know, uh, jet, uh, private prop planes that go yeah. out, and if somebody gets hurt, this is the this is what your ambulance looks like. Don't expect it to arrive within 24 hours. It's going to take a while, but that's, yeah. you know. And it's funny, my wife is Australian as well. She was, Her father was a uh, teacher and, when, um, and, and became quite advanced in the education system. He became principal of school and eventually worked for the education department. And um, when she was in her secondary school uh, age, they went to Papua New Guinea um, which at the time was full of cannibals. <laughs> and she went into the, uh, her family, her, her father was tasked with building schools in the highland regions in Papua New Guinea. So she spent many years raised with the natives in those areas where they spoke pidgin English and it was, you know, it was like living in an Amazonian rainforest. Um, and so when she thinks in terms of, what we would call the country in Australia, mm. uh, her perspective of it is very different than what mine is. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose going back to what you're saying, uh, Australia sort of uh, everything in in the is there wanting to bite and eat you. <laughs> you got to about the locals in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, they want to bite and eat you too. <laughs> yeah. Right on. <laughs> so, so she managed to survive that then. Yeah, it's a bloody miracle, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we did. So this, this, this the school. How did you do at the school? I, I mean, sucked. I was horrible. Yeah. I was, you know what? I skate. I because I was a musician and I had all this musical training. Yeah. I just used. I skated on that. I, I got a, a. There was a. There was a. A big band, you know, like a brass band type yeah. thing that the school had. Of course, you can't play violin in it. So the, but the conductor saw me as, or the band leader saw me as like, well, you know more than all of these kids combined about music because of your background. So if, as long as you don't bother me, I'll just give you straight A's. So I'm like, <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> so so you're like, well in music then. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he didn't want to be so, – the problem was he didn't really know what he was doing, right? What's that old Woody yeah. Allen line? Like, uh, no, is it the Groucho Marx line, those that can't do teach. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so this guy, you know, he's trying to teach music to a bunch of kids who have never picked up instruments before, and along comes this kid from the symphony orchestra who's like, okay, well, <laughs> don't don't make me look like I don't know what I'm doing and I'll just give you straight A's. Right on, brother. <laughs> and that was how I got through school. So my everything sucked, but I was really good at uh, geography, history, um, English, and economics, which is weird. But none of that made any sense because I just did music and just got straight through on that. Yeah. So what what then um, brought you into to the computers? What was your first computer? I guess something there was a Sinclair out at the time, and then there was a mm-hmm. BBC computer. Yeah, even before that, I, I bought a TRS eighty Model One, which was the Radio Shack Tandy machine back in the day. It was nineteen seventy seven, mm. and uh, yeah, I you know that was I had a paper route that I saved up my money and I that and convinced my dad to give me a some money as well, and I paid him back, you know, as you do, and. Mm. Um, yeah, that became my my uh, 
machine of choice and that's what I cut my teeth on. Um, I learned the art of being ahead of trends and being ahead of curves uh, yeah. because, you know, for a kid who could actually earn a living programming on computers, that was, you know, for decades before, that was never something that would ever happen. You had to go through a very regimental education and go to university and get graduated and then become accepted by your peers and get experience. You you weren't uh, contributing to the greater economics of the world until you were in your 40s, traditionally. Here's a kid at 16 writing software for companies and helping them do a better job with what they did. And it was like, that's unheard of. That never, ever happens. Yeah. Uh, so what, know, I fell what, was into it. what was the computer language that you were using then? Well, I started off in ba basic, which is just what anyone learned. And then I learned what they called assembly code, which is like chip level stuff. And then eventually I le wrote in a language called C, which was a uh, one level above that. Uh, and that's pretty much what I stayed with for a long time. And ever since then I've dabbled in other languages, but I, I learned how chips work and how electronics work. So it wasn't just about programming them. It was about understanding them. Um, it's funny because I had a conversation with a friend of mine last week and he said, oh, his kid it was about 15. He said, Oh, my kid wants to learn how to program. What should he, what should he learn? I said, it, it, your kid needs to learn how to solve problems. That's what your kid needs to learn. Don't worry about anything else because in the world of technology, there's no such thing as an education. Every time something new comes out, you learn it and you're constantly learning it and you're constantly relearning it. When I was at that age, I was saying, well, maybe I should go to university and study computer programming. There was no such course. There was no yeah. such thing. I, had, I could have taught it. And so it was like, what's the point of doing all these uh, studies that are got, not going to benefit me at all? I already know my calling. Let me do that. And so I was part of a of a, a group of people who created an industry. I was not being taught by an existing industry, which was very unusual. Yeah. So how did you actually learn that stuff? I guess uh, it, there was there were, there wasn't any courses. Or, you know, you know, you know. Well, it, it, somebody gives you a problem, and you learn to solve it. And, and this is what I was telling my my buddy last week. I said, look, you. The ability for you to be able to, somebody says, I've got this problem. I've got a business and we do these things and we're sick of doing it and it doesn't really make any money or it doesn't do this or it doesn't do that. And I'm looking at going, well, you could automate that. You could do this. You could do that. And they're like, well, well, can you do it? And I'd be like, yeah, okay. And so I'd go hmm. into organizations I knew nothing about, no idea. And I had no business being in them, but I was a really, really good person to ask questions. I knew how to elicit people to give up their knowledge and I would lead them down a path that would allow them to cross check themselves. So I could verify that what they were telling me was actually not their perception of something, but it was actually what was happening. And that mm. back in the, back in the days of the, I guess later into the eighties, as I turned that into more of a formal career we used to call those people systems analysts well those jobs yeah. have gone there there's no such job title anymore and now the the technology defines who we are we don't define the technology but back in those days the human being defined what needed to be done and guys like me made it happen right so you start off at 16 you, you how how quick did you progress to sort of make it into a viable business? So you didn't go to, to college or university then. So you, you're just learning off your own back, uh, yeah. solving problems. Well, I took a couple of small jobs um, in electronic stores and eventually in a computer store, and I met a lot of people. Uh, that took maybe a, a year to two years of time, and – by doing that, I got myself networked into the city and that enabled me to then uh, find a, an office and rent it, um, set up shop. And about that time, I guess we're getting into 78, 79, somewhere around there. 
just prior to that, there was this uh, news that was going around in the computer world about IBM, who at the time were the biggest mainframe, big computer company. I mean, they were everything. Mm -hmm. And they had this personal computer they were working on and uh, they were going to release it. I think it ended up coming out in 1980, 1981. Uh, I had said every business is going to want one of these things. Everyone at the time was saying, nah, that won't, you know, they're, they're not going to, I'm not like, no, trust me, they're going to want one of these. So I remember reaching out to somebody in Sydney who worked for IBM in Australia and said, I need to get my hands on one of these machines the day they become available. And I managed to do it. And I, I spent like $10,000, which at the time was a King's fortune. You know, mm. I had to go and get a bank loan and everything, but I bought one of these computers and I just pulled the damn thing apart. And within three months I worked it out. I was writing software for it. And then all of a sudden it got general release into the market. And I was right. Everybody wanted one of these computers. And that's, that was what really got me into the bigger corporations, the government departments. And so I guess I was probably about 19, something like that at the time. Uh, that was a big move for me. And I also learned the art of being ahead of a curve, like analyze yeah. something pragmatically and go with your gut. And at that age, I'd make a lot of, lot of mistakes and they could have been extremely expensive, but I could always recover. Yeah. Um, well, in so this case, I did. 10,000 know, pound on the computer and pulling it to bits. <laughs> for a 19-year-old for a kid, yeah. Yeah. And not knowing how to put it back together would have been a drama. Totally. Yeah. But these machines were built so you could do that. And, yeah. and that's, you know, one of the beauties about that design was that it was very open and, and I, and I, I developed a appreciation for being able to, I guess they call it right to repair over here right now, which is the ability for you to own the stuff that you own and pull it apart and void warranties. I mean, that, that was what I did. So that's, that's how you, 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 you got into the game. So you, you, you you got a loan. You spent ten grand on this this great computer. Pulled it to bits, stuck it back together. Mm -hmm. Worked out how it worked. Worked out what you programs you could write for it, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then you you went selling your your wares. Yeah, and, and you know here's something funny. Um, this people would would look at me like in shock if I told you this, but back in the day, if somebody came to you and said you know something about computers. Can you do this? And they gave you some, I don't know, weird task. Can you, you know, manage my, uh, I don't know, I've got 20 farms and 50,000 herd of cattle or something and I need to manage them. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about farming. I don't know anything about agriculture, agronomics, land management. I know nothing about that. You know what the answer to that question was every single time? Absolutely. The answer is always yes. yes. You do the things you can't do and you allow them to put the pressure on you so that you rise to the occasion, you learn it. And that was the story of my, my entire youth. Every single thing like that. Somebody put an opportunity in front of you. Absolutely. Yes. When do you want it done? Mm -hmm. uh, even though I couldn't do it, I didn't know squat about it, but that's how you learn. Yeah. So I guess from, from, from that perspective, you just look at the problem and then you come up with a solution to mm -hmm. how you how you manage whatever's going on. Yeah, and that's how everybody did it back then, right? Bill yeah. Gates got – IBM went to Bill Gates in, uh, I guess, the 79 and said, we've got this computer we're building, this PC. We don't have an operating system for it. Do you have one? And he said, absolutely, yes. He didn't have squat. <laughs> he had nothing, but he knew a few people who could cobble something together and he made it his mission to solve the problem. And as a result, he became the richest man in the world. That's how yeah. you have to do it. And anybody who looks at me and says, oh, you can't lie to people that you know something you don't, or you can't do this. It's like, trust me, that's how big things happen. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I say governments do it all the time, but they don't deliver. Big time. <laughs> right, right on. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to, you know, you got to be ethical. You got like what I mean by yeah. that. You got to, you got to deliver. You're right. Yeah. You've got to deliver. But nothing happens without breaking a few eggs. Hmm. 
So how did that take you along the, the road then? So IBM released their, their PC. Mm -hmm. You're writing software for it. You, you've got contracts coming out your ears by saying yes to everybody. <laughs> right. Um, did, did you actually ever, ever say no to anybody? <laughs> I don't remember doing that. <laughs> if they had money, I'd said yes. <laughs> yeah. So you, you got yourself into the marketplace, and, and I guess that grew. So where did it take you? Well, I, I played the exact same game a few years later in 1984 with the uh, Apple Macintosh. So mm. what, what the, just prior to that, they released a computer they called the Lisa, which is big, expensive monstrosity. And I got my hands on one and I learned how it worked. And uh, that led me into the world of the Macintosh before the Mac came out. Mm. And uh, it just so happened that a big... The government had awarded a defense contract for $5 billion to build some submarines. And uh, it was a big thing in our city. It was a big employer. And they they needed people to do it. And some the guy who ran the IT department, or they used to call it MIS department back then, mm -hmm. um, he had this idea that every single person working at this new massive startup had to have a Macintosh and, I, and, and there was one problem with that. There was no software. <laughs> and they needed, <laughs> they needed to outfit 500 Macintoshes with no software. And <laughs> along comes Miles. I, yeah, I, I know. I know. I, absolutely. I can write software yeah. for that. I know how that works. Yeah, well, I, I learned. And I made it yeah. work. And I built them software. And the first project they gave me was... Uh, we have to bill $5 billion to the Royal Australian Navy for these submarines and we have to do it like incrementally per month and it's based on all these contracts and all this complicated defence stuff and I'm like, okay, whatever, yeah, sure, I'll work it out. And I did and I wrote a software that published them every month wrote a $50 million invoice to the Navy for the progress they were making building these boats and and I was 22 when I did that. Um it was when I look back on it, I'm like, "You idiot!" <laughs> and then is bad, right? They they said, "Sure, get the 22 year old kid to run our entire freaking business here," you know. Well, and, that's uh, what you do nowadays. If, if you've got a, got a problem with your with your phone or anything like that, give it to a five year old. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it was so successful that after it worked out, they came to me and said, "Would you like to job here? We we need someone to." we need you to work in the logistics area. And I am like, I don't even know what that means. He says, well, this is the things like life support, like oxygen for the boat and ship to shore telemetry and stuff like that. And I'm like, you're going to trust a 20 year old kid with the lives of 41 crew that I can keep oxygen going with the computers. Yeah. You're the best we got kid. <laughs> All right. Sign me up. So they did and they gave me a secret clearance and they gave me all of the stuff you get in the military. And and then I hung out with a lot of guys from the Navy and and I learned that the guy in the cubicle next to me could die if I screw up. So I decided I better learn how to do this right. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I ended up meeting uh, people who were engineering experts from all over the world that had been flown in. And I met this guy who was the head of... Uh, a project from the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh in, in the States. And he was the guy who had written the standard that we had to write all of our documentation, our testing to. And he was this old Jewish guy. And I didn't know him from anything from just this nice guy that I met who found himself in Adelaide. And I knew he lived in America, but I didn't know where or, or his background, but he was just this nice guy. And we became really good friends. And I remember the funny thing is Adelaide at the time, we got uh, a Formula One Grand Prix race came to Adelaide that we got the rights to host one. And uh, funny thing enough, that's actually where Michael Schumacher won his first world championship. Um, but of all things that this event was a big thing in the city and this guy was in town and I said to him, um, his name's Manny. And I said, Hey Manny, what are you doing on the weekend? He goes, Oh, nothing. I'm just, you know, I'm here working. I've got nothing to do. I'm like, right. You come with me. We're going to the formula one race. I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about it. Let's go. And he's like, all right. So <laughs> 
Next thing you know, me and this old guy are in the stands watching this race and we loved it. And I'm a huge Formula One fan ever since that. Um, but we became such good friends. I, but again, I didn't realize who he was. I knew he was doctor something, but I didn't know what. Turns out he's the head of the Software Engineering Institute in Carnegie Mellon, which happens to be the guys that all defense projects in the United States from the Pentagon go to be uh, sanctified before they award the contracts to the vendor. Mm -hmm. And he lived in Beverly Hills and he's, you know, very wealthy, very well-to-do kind of guy. Um, and he said to me one day, he said, do you really like working here? And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I'm getting a bit sick and tired of the paperwork. I said, I like writing software and everything, but, you know, he said, why don't you come to California? And I said, well, I can't, you know, I, 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 I haven't got the immigration. They wouldn't let me in and whatever. He goes, well, if you ever do, hit me, look me up. I, you know, he gave me his phone number, contact details or whatever. He goes, you know, we're good friends and look me up. And I'm like, okay, fine. So, you know, I bet maybe six months or a year goes by and I was really getting bored at this point because my company that I had, we, we closed it myself and, and some of the staff had gone out working for the clients that we had. Um, the, the recession was, this was at a time when interest rates were like the base interest rates were 20%. Yeah, we you know, it, it was really harsh. The recession was hitting. And and so I had this gig with this submarine place, but the, there wasn't much else going on. And I was really bored. And a, a friend of mine said to me, why don't we go on a vacation to Hawaii? And I said, sure, all right. I'm up for that. Get me out of this place. So we took some of our time, you know, our leave that we had, and I went to Hawaii. And I'd never had a passport before. I'd never traveled. I But I flew to Hawaii and... It was so much fun. We had a blast. And I met this girl and she was from California of all things. And we hit it off. And, you know, I guess as a young 24 year old now, um, you know, I fell in love with this girl and I, there's no internet back in those days. No. You know, if you, you have a long-term relationship, you're writing letters, you know, yeah. making and expensive phone calls. To wait for to come. <laughs> right on. But I went back to Australia. She went back to California. We kept in touch. And then one day I said, you know, I am so sick and tired of this place. And I still had more uh, holiday leave built up. So I said, I'm going to fly to California and see her. So I did. I got to Los Angeles and I was Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what, what I got myself into. I'd never been to a city like this before. Um <laughs> I, I can I can just see you there. G'day, I'm Miles. Right. <laughs> from Australia. <laughs> exactly. I was embarrassing myself everywhere. You I'm like, life, you? you're driving on the wrong side of the road. What the hell's going on? You know. Hey, Doby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But she took me in and, and you know, we I was there for quite a while and we ended up getting married. Um, it wasn't it wasn't expected, but there was this weird problem that and the United States still has immigration problems, lots of them, but I couldn't stay there very long and I couldn't come back and forward very easily. And I ended up saying, well, I've got to make a decision. Do I, is my life going to be working in this submarine place, you know, bored out of my skull? I've got the skills. I know what I'm doing. I need to, maybe I need to go up a level here, you know, maybe working in, going into a mega city is the answer. And, you know, I, I did. So we ended up getting married and went to Vegas and did the Elvis thing and got married and came back to LA and then hit, a, went to an immigration attorney. He said, okay, well, I can change your status from tourist to, you know, being a resident here, but it's going to take about six months. And once we file the paperwork for this, you can't work, you can't do anything. You just got to sit around for six months. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, do what you have to do. I, I'm not leaving. So I'm on the phone, you know, calling up my friends saying, can you pack up my apartment and put my car in storage? And I caught, you know, quit my job over the phone and all of that. <laughs> and then um, I'm sitting around doing nothing. And my, my, my wife now, she had a job. She had to go to work every day. I'm sitting around in this apartment bored. So I, I went out on the street and, you know, I, I didn't realize you shouldn't go out on the street in L.A., 
I'm a kid from Adelaide. Everywhere's safe where I came from, right? <laughs> so we were in the San Fernando Valley, which is near Ventura Boulevard. So I'd go up and down Ventura Boulevard. And the one place that I ended up going to all the time were the guitar stores because, you know, I'm a musician, right? Yeah. I can play guitar. I ended up buying a guitar with what little money I had. I didn't really – when I went to America, I really had nothing. I, You know, I took what little I had and – most of it covered all the costs of getting there and it was about it. And I bought a guitar and an amp and then they had these signs on the board, you know, musicians wanted and mm. you'd get, you know, people trying to form bands and they need other guitarists or whatever. So I'd get on the phone, call them up. And I met this guy from Ireland who was trying to form a band and nicest guy. And uh, we got on like, a house on fire. We were because we were kind of kindred spirits. We were both outcasts. Ended up somehow in LA, and <laughs> and you know we were both into similar musical styles, and so we ended up forming a band. And I remember we, you know, because I couldn't work, right? So I had all this time in my hands, and so I we wrote a lot of music and played a lot of stuff, and hung out in a lot of guitar stores, and then rented rehearsal spaces and formed a band, and. Within six months, we were playing in all the clubs up and down the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, and I got to know Hollywood very well. Um, I met so many people, and we actually ended up winning some unsigned band competitions by the local radio stations, and and then we ended up in studios and recording, and it, it kind of it just grew on its own. And and mm. uh, I guess a couple of years later, the band broke up, but. I'd made so many relationships with people in the music business that I kept those relationships going. And because I was technical with this musical experience, whenever I was in a recording studio, the, there's if you if I'd been in a recording studio, there's a, a glass barrier between the control room, which is where all of the engineers work and the big mixing consoles and everything, and on the other side is the live room where the musicians perform with the mics are. And I was in the live room all the time and I always looked on the other side of the glass and saw what they were doing and all these big desks with the knobs and everything. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> that technical kid came back yeah. and he's like, I want to be where they are. <laughs> so I ended up getting uh, working out how recording works and I, I built relationships with very profound people in the music business who I didn't really even know. And my friend that, you know, I was in Adelaide with my Manny, I, I hooked up with him and next thing he got me work after I got my work permit mm -hmm. and I ended up working for a bunch of places with him and a lot of startups and things like that. And I had this relationship going on with people in the recording business. So I, at nighttime I was working in, in recording studios and uh, I learned the art of recording from some really great, uh, engineers and people who have worked on Tears for Fears albums and mm. stuff like that, real high end. Uh, and when you get access to multi-million dollar recording studios in Hollywood and people like that, you know, this kid, right, the guy who says yes to everything, um, <laughs> I'm learning again, right, and I'm doing the same thing. Um, meanwhile, the work I was doing, my day job, I ended up working for this uh start up in this field where I didn't even know what it was called biotechnology. And uh, I had no idea. I went and interviewed for this place. They had all they had were these like mobile trailers as offices because they were, they were building their labs. That's all I knew. So I interviewed with them and they gave me a job writing software and I eventually, you know, got work for them and they give you this thing over there called stock options because they didn't have anything substantial to offer mm other than just a salary. Well, little did I know that that place ended up becoming Amgen, the world's largest biotechnology corporation. And I got stock in it before they even had a product. And so I became a millionaire, like unexpectedly. Wow. Um, but that wasn't what I really wanted to do. As much as I love technology, I love software. And I did that for maybe four or five years there. Um, it, my calling was in the recording studios. That was where I really wanted to be. Um, and everything was going swimmingly. I bought a house. Uh, I built my own recording studio. I started doing all these projects with these unknown artists that once in a while they actually became something. Um, I started to build a reputation as somebody who could get the job done in the recording business. So I was working in uh, 
all these studios and then everything was great. I remember I got, I got signed up to do a, an engineering project in a studio in Hollywood uh, for this band that had coming down from Seattle who I didn't know. Turns out they were the Foo Fighters. I was supposed to be the engineer on their first album. And the next thing you know, I get a phone call from Australia that my mother had a car accident and that I had to go to Australia to see what was going on. So I put everything on hold, jumped on a plane, went back to Australia and found out that she had uh, early stage uh, dementia and she couldn't look after herself anymore. So I had to go back there and I became the caregiver and, and this kid, you know, went from nothing to being a hero in California and mm. doing all these amazing projects and making all this money, went back to his hometown and ended carer. up looking to be a carer. Mm. And my wife came with me, but she didn't last very long. We got a divorce and she left. And and then I ended up in a really dark place. And, and this is where the story gets really weird because when she left and I had no – I, I, it was like the, I was 32. It was kind of the end of my world. I was a caregiver back in my hometown. I didn't fit in. I was like Frodo returning to the Shire. I'd had all these adventures and no one understood me and I didn't really understand them. And I, I, I didn't really want to do what I used to do. I tried to escape it and I successfully did, but I was called back in again. Um, I was kind of depressed and I went into a pretty dark place and some friends of mine, it's funny, the guy who I went to Hawaii with reached out to me and said, look, um, you don't need to be in this dark place. You need to come with us. We're going to go to Queensland, which is on the, a couple of day drive from Adelaide yeah. um, for uh, Christmas, uh, for New Year's. You need to come with us. I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. I've got nothing else I'm doing here. So I did. What, and we what did you do with your mother? She was there. She was there. She was, she was, it was early stage dementia. So she was independent, but uh, she was independent to a degree. Yeah. But I, and then, I didn't and just go off on one and just disappear and yeah. wouldn't know where she'd yeah, been. Right. So, systems. Yeah. Was, so I kind of, whereas I didn't have to be there before and I could, you know, be in the States, I, yeah. I did have to be there at least once every week. So going off for a, a couple of days to Queensland and then coming back wasn't a big deal. So I did that on the way back. Uh, we were driving through the outback of Australia and um, I was in the back of the car in the back seat. My buddy was driving. His girlfriend was in the passenger seat in front of me and I'm sitting there reading a book. I remember it was a book about Lou Reed of all things. And I was reading this book and we're going through the middle of nowhere. I mean, this desert out there. Mm goes up over this kind of rise on the road. I wasn't paying attention. I hear this splash. I'm like, what the hell? The desert, the Australia is a desert. You know, it's arid mm. outback. I don't, you don't hear splash. I look up, the car's in a freaking river. And he hit it at a really high speed, like I'm going to say 80 mile an hour. Mm. So if you imagine throwing a stone over a river, it sort of bounces, yeah. it skips. That's what his car did. What had happened, there, there was a flash flood and the, it had gone through white the road out. We hit it at high speed. He bounces over the river and everything slows down and you see this. And I remember in my mind, I'm like, his name's Lindsay. I said, Lindsay, hold it together, mate. Don't lose control of the car. And then everything went black. Um, I woke up. This guy with these jaws of life cutting the car apart to pull me out. I'm wedged under the front seat on top of me. His girlfriend's sitting on the front. She's on the front seat. She's out cold. I didn't know where he was. I'm kind of like, I woke up and I'm like, okay, did my fingers work? Yeah, they work. Did my toes work? Yeah, that works. Okay, I can deal with this. This is fine. And then I'm, the guy's cutting me out. And I said to him, dude, get her. She's, get her, get her. And he's ignoring me. He's not saying the damn thing. He pulls me out from this wreckage, out from the car, and that's when I realized she was killed. And she's so I literally woke up with her dead body on top of me. Mm. Her neck was broken, and you know, that was pretty horrific. They put me in the ambulance, took me to the local country town, and then put me in a uh, one of those medically induced comas, um, which I was in for about a couple of weeks, I reckon a week and a half, maybe. 
they'd airlifted me back to my home city and put me in one of these hospitals. And I woke up morphined out of my mind and, you know, half of my body was destroyed and my leg was shattered and I was lucky to be alive. And everyone keeps telling me that. And you're like, yeah, I know that, but I feel like crap, you know? (laughs) Uh, Anyway, (laughs) my buddy Lindsay's in the bed across the, the room from me in the hospital because, you know, much like the NHS in Britain, mm. we have a medical, public medical system and it's pretty shocking. It's it's not, it's great for triage, but it's not great for long-term care. But we're all shoved into the same room so they didn't have enough beds and eventually I talked to Lindsay, what happened? And he tells me the whole story and I'm like, oh, shit, you know, this was um, pretty bad. Anyway, I eventually got out they they turf you out well before they should and so i got sent back to the house i had and i i I, one side of my body from the shoulder down was destroyed and the other side of my body and my leg down was destroyed so i'm kind of in this awkward i've got like a crutch that's holding up this lopsided body you know (laughs) but i managed to get limp myself around and they send out a nurse every day to help and it just so happens that the girl who was killed a friend of hers was staying in her place and she was a backpacker and she was a nurse, but she had returned from two years living in Germany and she got turfed out of this place she was staying at because she was killed and the parents were distraught and they wanted, they had to reclaim all this stuff. And so I said to this girl, well, if you need a place to stay, I've got this house that I bought and my wife's left me and, you know, you can come stay in the house. So she did, and she was a nurse, so she kind of became a bit a bit like my caregiver. She should have yeah. didn't do that, but she took care of the logistics of things. Well, you know, as it happened, years later, um, <laughs> well, actually, funny enough, six weeks later, I th- this immigration crap I'd found myself in in the States, they, they give you a green card. And the rules are you can't leave for six months before you step foot back on U.S. soil or you um, you lose it. Hmm. So I'm like, uh, i I got to go back to the States. I at least have to land on the U.S. soil and go back, but I'm a cripple. And, you know, I've got my arm in a sling and a crutch. And and I said to her, do you want to do you want to come with me to the States? And she's like, I've never been to America before. I'm like, oh, well, I, you know, I, I I can show you around if you, you know, I'm not much good, but I can probably drive a car. I could show you around. All right. So she did and she came and, and we ended up, you know, I met my immigration requirement and, and now I just got to know her more and more. And over months and months of time after I returned back and, you know, she was still living in the place and she was working as a nurse around, you know, town. And I was trying to put my life back together again, the little I could. I couldn't work, but I could, I was taking care of my mom. Hmm. We, we just hit it off. We were, you know, like, it was like the girl that I'd never, um, that I'd always wanted to meet, but I never thought as a kid, this nerdy computer kid could never get a girl like that, you know, and it just happened that situations and we ended up getting married and we had a daughter two years later. Um, we, I tried to make a go of living back in Adelaide and three or four years later, my mum passed away. So I, all of the shackles of being there were released, but I, I'd gotten into the habit of being back in my hometown again. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't really want to leave anymore. I, I, I wanted to raise my family and I wanted to be the, I wanted to be the breadwinner, but there wasn't much money. And, you know, I'd everything that I had got, lost in divorce settlements and then paying for my own rehabilitation. Uh, but I got a phone call in 99 from one of the guys I worked at at, uh, at Amgen. He said, there's this dot-com boom going on over here right now. We really need you. Um, would you come over for six weeks and work with me on a project? And I'm like, well, all right, I've got nothing else to do. So I, I, I jumped on the plane and went back to California and ended up, calling my wife from there saying maybe maybe you should bring the kid over with yourself and we could make a go of this because there's a lot of business here. There's a lot of money to be made and I can't do it back in, you know, we'll start from nothing again, but yeah. this, won't, this won't be my first rodeo. I've done this before. 
I can hook up with all the people I used to know and my contacts and I can go back to work and make some money. She said, sure. I mean, remember, she's the girl who went to Papua New Guinea as a kid and then she was living in Germany for two years. She didn't care. And my daughter, you know, she's a traveler and my daughter's like 18 months old now. So she wasn't really, she had no idea where she didn't know who she, she, yeah, right. So they jumped on a plane, came over. We rented a house and said we'd stay there for 12 months. So we kept our place in Australia and I, I rented it out, became a, a, an unexpected landlord and, uh, living in the States, you know, we got a house and we got a life, bought some cars and, and 12 months later, you know, we sat down and said, well, do we want to go back or do you want to stay here? And we both said we should stay, you know, Mm -hmm. there's more here. And that was right before nine 11 (laughs) and nine 11 happened and the world went to, to hell and, the dot com boom went to the dot com bust and and it was living hell and and uh but you know i I said to myself, I've been through a lot so far in my young life, and I could survive nearly getting killed in a car accident, I can survive mm-hmm. traveling over to the other side of the world, divorce if I can get through all of that and get through anything, this is nothing, so yeah, we did. We put all of our stuff in a U-Haul van and drove to Arizona because it was cheaper to live here and we both liked the sunshine. We didn't realize how much of a desert it really was, but we we, <laughs> we bought a house and we, we moved in and it was fun. Hmm. And um, we became Arizonians and we uh, put our kid in school and I started building up a business here and within a couple of years, surprisingly, because of all, we, we started speculating in real estate Mm -hmm. and, um, we, it's a whole technical thing I don't want to go into, but we ended up becoming millionaires again, two or three years later, we were wealthy and it was like, how did, you know, this kid who's gone from zero to hero to zero back to hero again, um, going around the block like that, it makes your head spin, but (laughs) But I, I became the breadwinner I wanted to become for my family. I, I couldn't – maybe I had to put my musical career aside, but I at mm-hmm. least achieved what I needed to achieve. And, and everything was great until 2008 happened, the global financial crisis. Yeah. All of our money was in real estate and we lost pretty much everything. And um, I had friends of mine that – were just foreclosed on, went bankrupt. And I remember even went to a bankruptcy attorney and said, you know, should I go bankrupt? Of course, they're going to say yes, right, because they get billable hours. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> but, they, they get, they, they, they're the only ones that do well out of bankruptcy. Right. The yeah, they yeah. do. So I said, no, you know what? I remember I could get through that car accident. I can get through anything. Screw it. We're staying. We're, we're staying. We're, we're hunkering down. We're going to make this work. As it happened, we had property in Australia and property in the United States, and Australia went through this resource boom. It was selling everything it could dig up out of the backyard to China, and it never got affected by the global financial crisis. If anything, its real estate just went up in value, and property I bought went tripled in value, and I I ended up just selling it all there, and I, took the, I paid the tax man his chunk of flesh, and I bought the rest of the money back. And I paid down our loans that we had in the States and got everything sort of settled. And then I had a lot of cash left. And I remember we sat down in the veranda out the back of our house one morning having a cup of coffee. And I said to my wife, you know, everybody, every all of the money that we've made came when I did the polar opposite of what everybody else did. You know, when everyone said, Go, uh, don't go in that burning building. I'm the one yeah. through the door, you know. When everybody said, you know, just take take life easy and do things, you know, low risk. I'm like, mm. I was raised with risk. Risk is my, <laughs> it's in my blood, right? It's what I do. How about we buy everybody else's foreclosures? And she's like, are you insane? No one wants to buy real estate right now. I said, yeah, I'm damn near insane and yeah. I can buy their properties for 10 cents on the dollar. So we did. We bought 20 properties at foreclosure auctions and three years later they all settled back to their normal price and I guess now I just sold a couple a few 
weeks ago, a few months ago, I made 11 times what I bought those properties for. And I went from being a multi-millionaire to being a multi-multi-millionaire. And I never, I never have to work another day in my life. And then it Until was like, a, again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was like, it was like, uh, but well, here's the weird thing, you know, you know, that old Monty Python line and, and uh, was it Life of Brian, not Life of Brian, in Holy Grail, about the guy who built the castle on a swamp and it fell down, <laughs> so he built another one, it fell down, he built another one, and eventually it stood up. That was my life, mate. I was building, <laughs> my life was building castles on swamps, but there was so much, uh, you know, debris underneath of it that eventually it stood up on its own and it stood up today. And, and here's, here's the weird thing. I realized that I'm 57 now, right? I realized that all of my life has been one big adventure. And if I could go, if the one thing I fear the most is I look at my father's life and he, he, he lived that conservative, predictable work for the same company for 40 years, retired at 65. He died at 67. And I said, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go, I, I'm not going, I'm not doing that. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to live that predictable life. I'm not going, I'm going to learn to surf. I'm going to learn to not, I want to manage myself better. I want to mitigate my own risks. I want to do all of that. I want to have an unusual life, a contrarian's life. I want to, I want to be Richard Branson living on an Island. I don't want to be, you know, working for the, at the steel mill for the rest of my life. That That's my, not my gig. Um, I would be miserable. And the biggest fear I have, people ask me, you know, what do you fear the most? I fear regret. That's what I fear. Yeah, there's no point in having regrets. No. I mean, look. So, so when you get to the old pearly gates and you're not in wait for Peter to come out, if you can sit there and say, I've got no regrets, I've lived a life and a life of one of my own choosing. Yeah. We're happy to walk through. Well, you you un, you you relate to that, right, Tim? I mean, you yeah, you understand that, yeah. yeah. It's not about it's not about how much money you got or all the your some some power tripping achievements that people have. It's just having a life where you don't regret anything. And I just don't want to regret that I missed not doing the things I wanted to do. And so, this is the interesting story. The last chapter, uh, uh, last chapter of the current book. Yeah. Um, so, um. We live in Arizona. We go into Mexico a lot because it's on our border. And I'm an immigrant, right? I came here as an immigrant. I'm from a country that I grew up in, you know, with things that will kill you. And, and I'm used yeah. to living in hostile land. And <laughs> so I go, I go into Mexico and all my American friends here are telling me, you're freaking insane, Miles. The cartels, the drug, they're going to chop your head off. You know, you're going to, I'm yeah. like, are you, are you serious? No, they're not. Propaganda. Yeah, really, it's propaganda. It is. So I, I, I go into Mexico and I learned that it is a whole lot of lies and I learned this wonderful country with people who have similar backgrounds to where we were raised. They, they respect family and community and they yeah. don't have much, but what they've got they share and they're, they're good, decent people. I mean, they're really decent people. And I'm living in a country where they've been trying to immigrate into and crossing the border in the hostile desert and dying without water. And, and I look at the whole thing and I go, well, I'm an immigrant. And I went through my version of that, but I did it differently. I mean, I did it with money and yeah. privilege and they're doing it with nothing. And yet they're mowing my lawns and they're the hospital orderlies and they're cleaning the table in the restaurants. And we have the audacity to think that we can just slag them off, that they're mm. less than we are. It's like, are you serious? They have the same gift of life that I got. It's just, yeah. you know, uh, this is ridiculous. So I'm, I'm going where they are. So we went into Mexico and we started to get to know Mexico, the, the whole country and eventually Central America, Latin America and so on. But um, we discovered a place that was just inexpensive to live and that people respected humans and social interactions more and, both my wife and I, uh, you know, we love America. We're both American citizens. But at the same time, there's so much of a, a distance between the world that we grew up with, which was nature and, 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, part of that, living in a big city of 5 million people here in Phoenix, you nature is just, you know, not dying of the summer. Make sure your yeah. air conditioner works. That's your risk mitigation strategy here. That's not... <laughs> Yeah, that's not what I was raised with, right? But in Mexico, yeah. it's a different different animal. So we'd spend more and more time down there, and eventually, um, we we ended up in this town that in central Mexico called San Miguel de Allende, and it's a haven of expats from all over the world, but very a lot of Americans. Americans go there because they can't afford to retire in America, and um, you know their social security or their pension doesn't. Yeah cut it it's not going to cover their food let alone their accommodation power bills and all of that and and they go into mexico because their dollar goes so much further and we met up with a lot of expats and i i sit down and have dinner with them and drinks and whatever we just talk about life and what their story was and some of them have served in the military and i can relate to my days back you know dealing with the guys in the navy that thankfully no one died um and you know (laughs) I, i i kind of understood why I understood the essence of why they did what they did. And I said to my wife one day, you know, maybe we should move here. Maybe we should build something here. She's like, well, I'd love to, but you, there's no such thing as mortgages in Mexico. You got to pay cash for everything. I'm like, well, you know, we've done pretty well for ourselves, right? We can sell a building or something and then buy something down here. Remember what got us out of that quagmire of the global financial yeah. crisis? Cause we had property in another country. Yeah. And she's like, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I said, we should do that. So she's like, okay, well, let's look around. So we're, we're wandering around the outskirts of town talking to every real estate agent. I said in my mind, I said, you know, I don't have to work anymore. Maybe I could finish that chapter of being the recording engineer, you know, the recording studio. I've still got yeah. a lot of contacts in Hollywood and I'm still pretty damn good at making records. Um, and I know that 20 years has passed since the last time I made a major recording for like Capitol Records, but, um, and the music's different and, you know, appreciation, yeah. but, but the essence of what musicians were, how I was raised, that, that human spiritual experience of music creation, that will never change. And it may be that the instruments change, you know, going from acoustic guitar to electric guitar and and then the synth era of the 80s and all that. Yeah, this yeah. stuff changes, but humans that make music don't. And I'd like to build that recording studio that was like those big studios I used to work in in Hollywood. Hmm. So I said, if we're going to build it, if we're going to buy anything in Mexico, let's buy enough property where I can build a big recording studio. So we're looking for land because it was like, I'm not going to buy anything prefabricated. I'm going to be dealing with the builders here and in, in my horrible broken Spanish trying to tell them how to build what I want. <laughs> and then one day we stumbled upon a guy who was the father of a friend of mine who knew a lady who had some property in this marvelous area. And it was an acre of land in this walled compound. And I'm like, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> Show it to me. So he shows it to me. And I swear to God, there's a bloody bullfighting ring in the middle of it. (laughs) I'm like, really? What's the story here? Well, apparently this property was a matador school. And the guy who ran it, he was one of the best matadors in in Mexico. And it's a very, very uh, famous place. And um, he died. I don't, I didn't, I never asked him if he died because a bull got him. I just, yeah. I just know he died <laughs> and his widow was distraught, but it was 10 years had passed and she held the property as kind of legacy to him, yeah. but eventually she wanted to um, sell it. So we said, well, maybe if we got rid of the bullfighting ring and we returned it back to its natural land as it was before, that maybe there's something here we could build on. It's, I mean, I, I swear to God, it's the most idyllic piece of property ever. Uh, it's beautiful, be- beautiful views. I mean, everything. Best weather you could ever imagine. Well, long story short, we bought it. We bulldozed the the land. And then I decided that um, we could build a big house for us. I could yeah. build a recording studio I wanted and we could build a couple of casitas, like guest houses. And mm-hmm. my goal was that I could encourage some of the musicians that I knew and some of the musicians I don't know yet to come to 
Mexico and record the best work of their lives in the studio. So the interesting part about this, <laughs> and everything kind of weird story here, I looked in history at anybody in the world who had done something like this before. And I seem to remember this story about the band The Police. And I remember that they went to some place in the Caribbean, recorded their last two albums there before the band split up. And it, it was kind of really indicative of their best work they ever did. And so I went to try to find out about where they went because I thought maybe I could learn from this experience because I want to build a studio in a faraway place and so, I want to so be able to, yeah. Keep going. Oh, okay. And um, so anyway, I built this, I, I, I did this history lesson in what happened and, and what actually happened was I find out that the studio that they went to was the most noteworthy studio in the 1980s that most of the major hit records, particularly out of the UK, came out of. Anything from the Dire Straits, they recorded Money for Nothing there and all their albums. Yeah. The, the Rolling Stones reformed there. Elton John reformed there. Uh, Rush, uh, every Paul McCartney was there. And the thing, the reason why they all went there was that the guy who built it was Sir George Martin, the producer of the Beatles. After the Beatles broke up, he decided to build a recording studio on an, on an island called Montserrat in the Caribbean called Air Studios. Mm. And every major artist in the 80s went there and did their work, which is why you hear so much Caribbean influence in musical hits of that period. Yeah, um, It's because of that studio. So I said, what happened to the studio? And I find out it was destroyed by a hurricane in 1989, but a few years after that, the island had a volcano. The volcano erupted and it literally wiped everything out, but the studio remained. So I did the, I got on the phone to the Minister of Tourism in Montserrat and I said, is this place still there? And he goes, yeah, it is, but the George Martin passed away in 2017 and mm. the property is still owned by his estate, his family's estate. But the guy hooked me up with uh, a guy who still lived on the island who's from the UK, and uh, he was one of the guys who was actually the original manager of that studio, and he still lives there. And I got on the phone with him, and for a couple of hours we were just talking. I'm telling him about recording and, you know, what I'd done. He's telling me about the recording industry as it was in the 80s, and, and he's like my friend Manny. You know, he's an old guy who yeah. we just hit it off. And... Next thing you know, he says, why don't you come to Montserrat and see the – I'll take you out to the studio. I've got to get permission from the Martin family. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. But there's this COVID thing, right? I can't travel. He goes, well, as soon as that lifts, I, he said, I don't stay here during the hurricane season. We, we go back to the UK in April. But he said, when I'm back here, get your butt on a plane, come here, and we'll go out to the studio. What's left of it? It's just this termite-infested, rotting, you know <laughs> – place but i'll send you the plans to it if you're interested i'm like i'm very interested i said how about this idea why don't i build my studio to be an exact replica of your studio of air studios mozzarat i said to the inch the same mm -hmm. wall treatment the same ceiling he said that'd be awesome he said do you know um the guys who built the uh, studio are still around he says, you know, they're in their late 70s, early 80s now, but they're still around. I'm like, well, hook me up, dude. So <laughs> he does. And I end up contracting with the original guy who built that studio for Sir George Martin, and he's building my studio in Mexico right now. Well, we're in the design process right now of doing it. And so my next chapter in life will be to move to Mexico and run this studio that is a legacy to – the eighties and a legacy to my background and a legacy to the music that I grew up with. And, uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> well, I, I can only wish you every success with that. And well, uh, thanks mate. Appreciate that. And if you can produce some music going back in time, then, uh, 
then it's got to be better than some of the rubbish that they're producing nowadays. <laughs> you know how many times I've heard that? So many people have said that to me. I'm like, yeah, I do. I, I, I get that. What my, my hope is that if I can produce a, a, a studio that's an homage to the past, that maybe some of the artists that worked in those studios back then might be inclined to want to come to Mexico and come and drink a tequila with me and maybe record some music there. I'm, I'm going to, we've already reached out to Mark Knopfler and see if he wants to come down. I've, yeah. I'm going to reach out to Sting and, you know, a few of the other, maybe Elton, maybe they'll come yeah. down and just hang out. Well, don't, Who knows? don't forget Ivan Bodley. Okay, I'll take anybody, mate. <laughs> so, so I, I, I did Ivan a couple of weeks back and uh, he's uh, a, a really good bass player that lives in New York and he, he's done 12 shows on Broadway and uh, and, and that. And I'm well, sure hook hook, hook me up. Never hook me up, mate. Hook me up. When we've, I just bought myself a, a 1988 Neve console from New York. I just flew there and bought it and it's being shipped down to to Montserrat right now. So we are trying to put back together the glory days and we're going to, and anybody who wants to come and be a part of it and wants to experience uh, a studio like this, um, I'd love to have them. That's why we we're building guest quarters yeah. on the property for people to come and stay. And um, I, I can't say anything, but the most wonderful thing about San Miguel Condé Nast voted it the number one small town in the world since 2014. Mm -hmm. It's an old Spanish colonial 1500s town. Uh, it's untouched. It's like you've gone back in time and it's beautiful. And to have a studio down there is a real service to the local community. And I'm, I'm hoping I can teach a lot of the kids and the universities in Mexico how to record something because they can't, they can't get immigration into the States to go and work in the studios I had the privilege to work at. So I'm going to bring the studio to them and maybe train them up and maybe make a bit of a school out of it too. That sounds like a, a brilliant, brilliant idea. Thanks, Miles. I've, that has been fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I mean, it's life's an adventure, right? This is what we're all about. Absolutely. Thanks. The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories.